Welcome to the Rare Books Department of the J. Willard Marriott Library at the University of Utah. The Rare Books Department is one of five departments within the Special Collections Division. Other departments include manuscripts, photo archives, audiovisual, and print and journal. Special Collections materials are held on the fourth floor of the Marriott Library and can be accessed by request in the Special Collections Reading and Reference Room. The Rare Books Department holds more than 80,000 items, including books, maps, ephemera, and realia, documenting the record of human communication, from Sumerian clay tablets to 21st century artist books. By actively collecting and digitizing material of historical and aesthetic importance, the Rare Books Department preserves a heritage of thought, artistic endeavor, an innovation that continues to inspire the human spirit today. We provide reference, research, and educational access to local, regional, and international communities, strengthening the ability of faculty to teach, students to learn, and communities to find common denominators. The philosophy behind the Rare Books Department has long emphasized the importance of the book as a physical object. Some of the most meaningful interactions with our collections occur in the classroom, where students are able to hold history in their hands. There is a clear etymological root between the words text and textile. We can trace it back to the Latin verb, texire, meaning to weave. The language of textiles provides us with certain figures of speech that bring a sense of materiality to writing. We weave a tale, spin a yarn, and piece together. There are stories that intertwine and threads that interlace. There are characters that get ensnared in a web of lies. There are ties that bind and relationships that fray. It is said we are cut from the same cloth. We wear our hearts on our sleeves. Material and immaterial textile, and text. Both have served as transmitters of cultural ideas. They have been linked to the sacred, to origin stories, prayers, songs, life cycles, myth-making, and storytelling. Both are made from stems, roots, fibers, whether beaten or spun. In some cases, textile evolves into text, as the fabric that was once created by workers in a textile mill eventually becomes rags in a paper mill. If we look closely, the book itself is nothing more than a form of fiber art. From paper to sewn binding to cloth covers, the book is the perfect example of the interwoven industry of textiles and text. This selection of books seeks to explore that relationship further. The demand for textiles has gone hand in hand with historical technological innovations. From the spinning jenny to the cotton gin, the shakar machine and the factory system. In the 19th century, the industrial revolution saw the development of new weaving machines at precisely the same time that changes in printing technology made books cheaper and more widely available. By the late 19th century, industrial schools had been established to better train the working classes in the numerous trades now operating in mass factories. The textile industry was one of those trades in which women and young girls were often recruited. The publication and wide circulation of sewing primers was seen as a way to encourage sewing skills in young girls. They included lessons and songs set to popular tunes, as well as other rules and suggestions. In the introduction to this sewing primer, Louise J. Kirkwood argues, if girls of but one grade, say from nine to 12 years, could be afforded the opportunity of becoming familiar with the use of the needle, it would be a telling step in the right direction, putting them in possession of a most valuable art, which would prove an armor of defense against temptation to idleness, which leads to want and so often crime that this little book may give an impulse in the direction of this industrial pursuit is the desire of a practical worker. The rare book's copy of this book is from the John R. Park Library Collection. 
John R. Park is considered to be the intellectual father of the University of Utah. During his 20-year tenure as university president, Park donated hundreds of books from his personal library to the university, developing the origins of the Marriott Library as we know today. Many of those books still remain and have been distributed within the Rare Books collection. In addition to sewing primers, sewing samplers taught young girls and women the tactile pedagogy of stitches. The history of the sampler is thought to date back to the early modern period, but few examples remain. Interest in collecting needlework samplers has increased greatly in the last several decades, no longer seeing the work as nostalgic folk art, but a tool for understanding the past and investigating the social and cultural history of manufacturing and design. Samplers such as this often included embroidered sayings, maps, family trees, multiplication tables, calendars, poetry, prayer and hymns, as well as alphabets. By the period of the Centennial Exposition in 1876, the American sampler underwent dramatic changes. Rather than exemplars of embroidered cloth, punched paper patterns for samplers became available. These had the design already marked out on heavy paper, with holes punched out for embroidery wool to slide through. While older samplers were probably made by adult women, 18th and 19th century samplers were likely made by young girls, as they became less about keeping a working record of stitches and more about proof of a basic skill and part of their domestic education. This sampler was owned by Hattie D. Squire, the great-granddaughter of Alexander Kirkpatrick, a Minuteman of the American Revolutionary War in the Somerset County, New Jersey troops. The sampler was then passed down to her daughter, Edith, whose signature can also be found on the first page of the book. Edith Squire Mudgett was born on February 7, 1888 in Nebraska. She married Harry David Hines on April 21, 1920 in Salt Lake City, Utah. Since the sampler was a direct personal link with past generations, often signed by grandmothers and great-grandmothers, it was much more likely to be kept than other material objects like cookware or furniture. Samplers were almost certain to be passed down in the family, and in the instances that they were given away, they were much more likely to be donated to museums or libraries such as ours to be kept as a historical record. Looking at such training samples, one gets a sense of a sort of bilingualism, a fluency in the visual and the verbal, something sewn and something printed, a dual language that often only women could speak. That language was, at times, unrecognizable and needed to be translated. With this textile design book, we might envision just that, a book of translations, the language of text and textile displayed on opposing pages. On the right, the language of textile, coded in 84 squares, with each square containing an 8x8 grid. It is the ancient language of weaving, a technology considered by some to come from the Neolithic, if not Paleolithic, period. And on the left, the English translation handwritten in black ink. While there are many variations of weaving, the foundational aspect involves interlacement. That is, one set of yarns crossing over and under another set of yarns. At its most basic structure, there are two sets of yarns, one that runs along the entire stretch of the fabric, called the warp, and one that crosses back and forth as it interlaces, called the weft. The illustrative diagram we see on the right page is a notational system called a draft, and it represents the fabric. Draft notations were created and consulted by the weaver in order to better plan the work on the loom. Note the inherently binary nature of the diagram. This will come in handy later, I promise. This personal textile design book was produced and sold by the J. Broadbent Company printers. It contains 96 leaves of design paper and interleaved with ruled paper that can be used for notes. This particular design book is printed in what is called a C pattern, meaning the configuration of 8x8 squares, or 384 by 296.
The language of textiles was also translated and adapted for some of the youngest readers in the form of storybooks. In 1912, 36-year-old school teacher Jane Eyre Fryer published the first in a series of juvenile books designed to teach young girls fundamental domestic skills, combining fact and fancy for a complete course in home ec. Like sewing primers we saw earlier, Fryer wanted to teach useful things in an entertaining way. But unlike the primers, she did so while weaving a narrative about a young girl named Mary Frances. But these were not mere storybooks. They were instruction books that followed the young Mary Frances as she learned domestic skills with the guidance of her fairy helpers, along with other characters such as the kitchen people and the thimble people. And as Mary learned the skills, so did the young readers of Fryer's books. In addition to Easy Steps in Sewing, Fryer also published six other volumes, including the Mary Frances Cookbook, the Mary Frances Housekeeper, the Mary Frances Garden Book, the Mary Frances First Aid Book, and the Mary Frances Knitting and Crocheting Book. While we may no longer perpetuate the stereotypes of domestic work being solely women's work, there is still an undeniable connection between textiles, female writing, and the shared experience of women. During the women's liberation movement of the 1960s and 1970s, second wave feminists gained new interest in family textiles, collecting quilts and samplers, and trying to learn traditional fiber arts. In searching for missing records and hidden histories, they saw in textiles a unique form of female writing that implicitly chronicled the lives and labors of their mothers and grandmothers before them. Teresa Pinkritz dedicates her book, The Wardrobe, to her mother, whose closets bulge with story. Designed to resemble a wardrobe of clothes interlaced with illustrations and text, Pinkritz muses on the differences and similarities between her mother's wardrobe and her own, with each page highlighting an article of clothing that is intrinsically linked to a specific memory or event. Perhaps our own wardrobes might reveal such intimate insights about our lived experiences. Clothing is not only a testament of our past, it is also the outwardly expression of who we are. It is a reflection of our personalities, a connection to unique cultures and communities, and sometimes even a declaration of our political beliefs. We wear our heart on our sleeves, as they say, and sometimes we wear some really ugly clothes. From the American textile worker strikes of the early 20th century to the contemporary inhumane conditions of textile workers in factories here and abroad, and the major environmental impacts resulting from synthetic waste and water use, the textile industry has been and continues to be very controversial. In 1996, the skeptical press of New Haven, Connecticut produced this little booklet to raise awareness about the ugly facts of fashion. Accompanied by images of clothing tags, the book digs deep into the serious issues of sweatshop labor, using excerpts from articles written in major publications like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the South China Morning Post, to name just a few. The 21 unnumbered pages include information such as the following. Women produce most of the clothing bought and worn worldwide. The exact percentage of women working in the garment industry varies among countries, but it is always upwards of 70%. Very often they are immigrants, and in some countries they are children. Hong Kong is the world's third biggest supplier of clothing, but many goods marked made in Hong Kong are made in China or Thailand. Thai industry has one of the worst safety records in Asia. There are an estimated 40 million children working in various jobs in Thailand. Those of who work in factories have often been purchased from rural parents by recruiters. While the information provided is truly ugly, the book ends on a reflective note, providing a list of all of the articles of clothing the author owns. Four pairs of jeans, six sweaters, four skirts, three dresses, seven blouses, two jackets, two pairs of slacks, 16 t-shirts, one turtleneck, plus various socks, tights, and underwear. The final statement? 
okay, these are my clothes, but I don't know what to do about it. If we were to list our own clothes, how would we feel? Because we do not typically see the production of textiles, we often forget that they are, in most cases, made by human hands. The same could be said about books. Yes, books are now produced by mechanical robots in the thousands all over the world, but at one point in time, the entire process was done by hand. Our familiarity with the book has made us blind to the intricate details of the paper, the binding, and the architectural structure. When we look at the book, we only ever see the text, not the textiles. Artist Claire Van Vliet seeks to redirect our attention to those details by experimenting with the book's form and structure in innovative ways. She is, perhaps, best known for her weaving techniques, interlocking the binding with strips of paper and thread. Claire Van Vliet is an artist, illustrator, typographer, and founder of the Janus Press named after the Roman god of beginnings and transitions, a perfect metaphor for the kinds of books she creates. For Van Vliet, to read a book is an act of opening. We open it and are open to what is inside. We expect to receive from a book. All the physical components of a book can act as facilitators for the essence of the text. They can engage the senses and widen the comprehension of the text ideally without interfering in any way. Reading a book is a dialogue, and the more the reader is encouraged to bring to the act of reading, the better it is for the author. Deep in the Territory is the third in a series of quilt books written by poet Margaret Kaufman and created by Van Vliet and the Janus Press. The 13 quilts accompanied by Kaufman's poems are built from interlocking strips and shapes of paper to form double-sided squares with two sides varying radically in most instances, both in hue and in format. Most amazingly, the complex book has no binding, in that there is no thread or glue holding it together. The text and quilt papers are folded, cut, and woven into tight patterns that hold all on their own. Kaufman's poems, including the titular Deep in the Territory, were inspired by Plains Women's Quilts, as a collector of such quilts, Kaufman closely observes the artifact and stitches together the poem, which then combines with Van Vliet's interplay of materials, text, and textile. Included with the book is a bag of paper scraps, which Van Vliet explained just seemed too nice to throw away. Scraps of paper or cloth can be sentimental. And if you're like me, you hold on to all of them, vowing to find a way or a reason to repurpose them later. Using repurposed cloth, many sewers create specialty needle books, decorated with patchwork pieces of different fabrics and sometimes embroidered with designs. These soft, small, portable books not only safely keep your sharp needles in place, they can also be reminders of past projects and containers for even smaller scraps. This needle book does in fact contain needles and pins, but within its patchwork we also find a poem titled Silver Needles, and all at once, text and textile become self-referential. Although the poem is not about sewing, it uses the language of textile to weave the imagery of the sky on a winter's day. Winter's cloak embraces me, walking out the door. White diamond-studded frost, cutting into metal, silver needles pulling white threads beneath the sun, winter bare trees drifting in and out of fog, azure carpet dotted with cumulus circles tossing about, should serenity be as gentle, misting rain, basking in this moment of nothingness. I have found the cotton trails of roaring thunder streaming upward toward the heavens and beyond, on silver needles pulling white threads beneath the sun. Little is known about the history of this little needle book, where it came from, when it was made. As for the Georgia poet, Barry Lanier, it is said that he once admitted when asked about his poetry, I have no special ambition. 
other than to give back hopefully a portion of what has been freely given to me. And should my written words help just one person, then my efforts have been a success. Like the books we read and the outfits we wear, scraps are more than capable of telling a story. Just ask artist Susan E. King. In her book, Redressing the 60s, Art Lessons a la Mode, King uses scraps from her collection of vintage clothing to weave the narrative of her journey as an artist, from her beginnings in 1965 as an art student in the UK to a 30-year stint in Los Angeles and back again. Somewhere along the way, King became a founding member of the legendary nonprofit community art center known as the Women's Building in Los Angeles. In addition, she headed the Women's Graphic Workshop and became internationally known for her artist books. Growing up in Lexington, Kentucky, Susan King was shaped by a family of Southern storytellers, including mothers who prowled antique malls and grandmothers who sewed in tatted lace. In a whimsical recollection of the influences on her life related to clothing and fashion, redressing the 60s can be considered part memoir and part cultural artifact combining original prose pieces with selected texts, plus a variety of fabric samples to adorn the pages. It begins. I started the 60s with the requisite wardrobe of wool pleated skirts and matching Shetland sweaters. Jackie had glamorized Mammy's matronly outfits of the 50s, but we were still expected to wear gloves and hats to church. As the decade began, the wildest I got was a madras shift with sandals, if worn with the right accessories, I could almost look beat, like one of the beat girls in a Life magazine photo. It was what I most wanted to be. As with redressing the 60s, Carol Schwartzot's Kimono Kosodi was published in 2001 by the National Museum of Women in the Arts. And while the former uses descriptions of clothing to drive the plot, the latter imitates the garment through the form and structure of the book itself. Bound with a piano hinge binding design in Japanese chiyogami papers, Kimono Kusodi reveals the history of the distinct Japanese garment while simultaneously alluding to the act of wrapping and unwrapping the material around the body of the book. A cutout of the iconic T-shaped design highlights decorative textiles represented by the different papers of each page. The first real indication of the kimono's importance in Japanese culture occurs during the Heian period, between 794 and 1185 AD. It was during this earliest period of artistic enlightenment that a mastery of poetry, calligraphy, and music, along with elegance in dress, became essential aspects of court life. Women were the first to wear kimono-style garments. The court lady's rule of dress was called the kasani-ji, or multiple layers of unlined robes, usually 12 to 20, were worn over the other. Since the inside of the elbow and the nape of the neck were considered erotic and sensual, each gossamer layer created a complex beauty at the collar and sleeve opening, where the colors of all were visible. A woman usually wore her court dress for several days at a time, not removing it even to sleep. Kusori means a thing for wearing. It is an old name for a form of dress that is now usually called kimono. The cultural aspects of the kusodi, involving as a kimono, also came about because of the increasing influence of women. And this, along with the changeover from a noble ruling class to the samurai and their beliefs, placed more emphasis on simple clothing. As kimono design evolved, the concept was to achieve the original beauty of many robes, creating a complex surface design on one single layer of fabric. With each period in history, the kasodi evolved, adapting its design and decorative elements to current style and availability of materials. Stitch or embroidered with silk and metallic threads, patterned with paste-resist foils and stencils, shiburi dyed and eye-cut wrapped, printed or silk screened, the kasodi has many different faces, each showing us a different time and place in the history of Japan. However, according to Nancy Bradfield, author of Costume and Detail, 
the inside of a dress is often as interesting as the outside and at times more complicated. And to understand a dress fully, a knowledge of the inside is essential. Linda K. Smith takes this notion of the inside and applies it to herself, creating a collection of descriptive essays about pieces of clothing that she, the one woman of the one woman sewing bee, would like to sew. Her essays are coupled with examples of clothing practices and beliefs, along with some secrets of clothing, all discovered in her readings on the subject. Vignettes of personal narratives make up the third strand of the text, exploring both the universal and the personal in the ordinary and basic structure of clothing. Smith views the book as her version of how we weave threads of our lives into a whole. The three strands of short and historical and personal essays which make up this textually and structurally entwined book are accompanied by hand-stitched paper, bead decorations, and pinhole patterns made by threadless sewing machine needle preparations. The narrative includes musings on the vest, the everyday dress, the courting dress, the special dress, the fantasy dress, the buttons, the glove, the shoe, and the mended piece. If you haven't noticed yet, the guiding thread, as it were, for this selection of books has been a focus on textiles, whether explicitly or implicitly. This next book uses this notion of a guiding thread, or clue, spelled C-L-E-W, to reflect on the deeper meaning of a marriage tree located on the grounds of a Hindu temple in South Africa, and the ritual of young women wrapping the tree with silk threads as a prayer to acquire a husband. The prose, printed in thin red lines across translucent paper, evokes a strand of thread moving across the page. Meanwhile, the illegible bold or black commentary might suggest a tangled ball of yarn, further depicting the author's conflicted views of the ritual. The text reads, I remember then being struck by the image of all those shimmering threads against the dark. I allowed my mind to drift to examples of wrapped art, from Christo to Windsor. I considered several evocative memories, like the wrapped tall candlesticks on the altar in a Roman church, and those balls in Yucatan that were made of layers upon layers of strings or rubber bands. Each recollection made me look longer at those threads. I thought pityingly about those young women for whom marriage is an essential and ultimate goal. But don't we also say tying the knot? What about tying a yellow ribbon around that old oak? not to mention all the post-9-11 memorials that cropped around town. I am sure that I never understood the evocative language of material, form, and presentation. I was certainly aware of the parallel symbols of bondage, but I am quite sure that I was naive to which factors encapsulated the meaning of containment. I was unable to either comprehend how myths with their rituals can be so transcendent or of the role of the initiated in sustaining their illusions, even after all the dreams have gone away. And I was totally unaware of the role of textiles as an essential form of women's communication. Text, texture, textile. Text, texture, textile. The ball of thread meaning of clue has been with us since before the 12th century. In Greek mythology, Ariadne gave a ball of thread to Theseus so that he could use it to find his way out of her father's labyrinth. This, and similar tales, gave rise to the use of clue for anything that could guide a person through a difficult place. This use led in turning to the meaning of a piece of evidence that leads one toward the solution of a problem. Today, the spelling variant clue, spelled C-L-U-E, appeared in the 16th century. It is now the more common spelling variant for the evidence sense. There is no doubt that textiles play an essential role as a form of women's communication, but would it surprise you to know that textiles, specifically woven ones, are what allow us to communicate digitally today? It's true, the origin of modern computers dates back to an early 18th century invention 
commonly called the Jacquard machine or the Jacquard loom. The Jacquard machine is a device fitted to a loom that simplifies the process of manufacturing woven textiles with complex patterns. The machine is controlled by a chain of punched cards, laced together into a continuous sequence. Multiple rolls of holes were punched on each card, with one complete card corresponding to one row of the woven design. These cards were replaceable and were used to control a sequence of operations, allowing only certain hooks to move through the holes in order to grab the appropriate thread and create the design. Though based on earlier inventions by Basile Bouchon, Jean-Baptiste Falcon, and Jacques Valconson, this mechanism was fully developed by Joseph Marie Jacquard in 1804, which is why he is often cited as the inventor. The Jacquard machine and loom revolutionized the textile industry and made possible the automatic production of unlimited varieties of pattern weavings, among so many other things. The Jacquard head and its replaceable punched cards is considered to be an important step in the history of computing software. The ability to change the pattern of the loom's weave by simply changing cards was an important conceptual precursor to the development of computer programming and data entry. Nostissons, translated from the French as We Weave, is a collaborative project produced by the Scripps College Press and Claire Van Vliet, which includes various texts on the subject of weaving and incorporates Van Vliet's unique bookmaking techniques. An additional narrative about Joseph Jacquard and the invention of his loom is both textually and structurally woven throughout the book. British inventor Charles Babbage had heard of the Jacquard loom and saw the potential in the use of its replaceable punched cards for solving math problems. But although he was a brilliant inventor, he could never quite grasp the mechanism of the loom. Perhaps this is because he did not speak the language of textiles. Enter Ada Lovelace, the abandoned daughter of poet Lord Byron. Sometime in 1833, Babbage met a young Lovelace at a party. They became friends and, as the story goes, Babbage showed Lovelace a small prototype of the computing machine he was working on at the time, inspired in part by the Jacquard loom. Unlike Babbage, Ada Lovelace realized the analytical machine's ability for uses other than mathematics. It could be used instead as a system of rules that can be applied to a vast range of intellectual pursuits, like music composition. Lovelace helped Babbage refine and direct his ideas, editing, footnoting, and often correcting his work. Although they carried on a lifelong correspondence, Babbage devalued Lovelace, calling her his interpress and the enchantress of numbers. Beyond his ability to recognize Lovelace as his equal, Babbage lacked some serious social skills and often alienated potential benefactors. They were on the verge of creating the world's first working computer, but the lack of funding halted any further progress. In 1843, ten years after they met, Lovelace wrote a long letter to Babbage, urging him to let her handle negotiations with the backers. He politely rejected her offer. Imagine how different the world would be today if he said yes. The dream of the analytical machine, or the difference engine as it was sometimes called, was never fully realized, and it took over 100 years for Ada Lovelace to be recognized for her contributions to the field of computer programming. In 1977, a new computer programming language was named Ada in her honor. She is now widely acknowledged as a computer pioneer. Ada's Echo, created by Kelly Wellman, includes text excerpted from Ada Lovelace's letters to Charles Babbage. Translucent paper forms the top and main text page through which the secondary text and shadowy images are seen. By layering the pages, progress is depicted as a process of accrual in which many hands and voices contribute over time. The modified accordion binding was produced by weaving pages together through grommeted corners at both the head and the foot with plastic paper strips. Pages are punched with different configurations of holes to recall punch cards of the Jacquard loom. The 
The erasure of Ada Lovelace from more than a century of history is not excusable. On the other hand, erasure as a form of poetry is something that can imbue new meaning into old words. In The Desert, poet and visual artist Jen Bourbon works in the tradition of poetic composition by erasure by meticulously sewing row by row across 130 pages of text. The text hidden under Bourbon's pale blue thread is John Van Dyke's prose celebration of American wilderness, titled The Desert, Further Studies in Natural Appearances. It was first published in 1901. Van Dyke, an art historian, claimed to have spent three years in the American Southwest Desert with only his fox terrier for company and a pony for transportation. According to Van Dyke, he only carried with him a rifle, pistol, hatchet, shovel, blankets, tin pans and cups, dried food, and a gallon of water. Despite the book being a huge success, it turns out Van Dyke's story was fiction rather than fact. The truth was that Van Dyke saw most of this great desert while looking out of windows of trains on his way from one first-class hotel to another. What Jen Bourbon does to Van Dyke's romantic rhapsody is breathtaking. Using over 5,000 yards of thread, Bourbon creates her own elemental landscape, with atmospheric fields of pale blue zigzag stitching to construct a poem narrated by the air, so clear that one can see the breaks. The poem that emerges from Van Dyke's desert was first composed at James Terrell's Rodin Crater in Arizona. Thinking of Terrell, Bourbon wrote, the great get on with the least possible and suggest everything by light. The text of the book was digitally printed by Jan Drozarski in Brooklyn on handmade twin rocker abaca paper. The books were machine sewn by Bourbon and a team of assistants in Seattle and bound in hand punched abaca covers by Susan Mills in New York in an edition of 40 copies. Many of Jen Bourbon's projects seek to unstitch the seams between text and textile. In the Dickinson composites, Bourbon once again uses stitches, but this time it is to mend the things that have been taken apart and taken away. The things I am talking about are Emily Dickinson's poetic marks, the familiar dashes, ubiquitous crosses and plus signs, and the variant words which are scattered throughout her manuscripts, but rarely, if ever, are reflected in the print editions of her poems. Rather than erase, Bourbon foregrounds these oft-omitted marks in order to see what patterns form when all the marks remain in position but are isolated from the text. To do so, Bourbon first scanned the original manuscripts, written by Emily Dickinson sometime between 1858 and 1864. The handwritten poems were composed on stationary folios into 40 packets, later called fascicles, and were stab-bound with red and white twist thread. The manuscripts were enlarged in order to convey the exact gesture of the individual marks, which were digitally rendered, projected, and then transferred onto cotton batting to make a series of large-scale embroidered works. The series includes five six-by-eight quilts, whose titles identify their relationship to Dickinson's fascicles. The quilts were prepared with a hand-sewn center line and machine-sewn lines that replicated those of the light-ruled paper, while the marks were embroidered in hand-spun and hand-dyed silk thread. Granary Books later published Bourbon's work as a limited edition artist book titled The Dickinson Composites, which include a sewn sample, large prints of each quilt, and a nestled booklet. In a New Yorker article about Bourbon's work related to Emily Dickinson, she is quoted as saying, It seemed to me that what she was doing was much more interesting than what was being done to her. In a later project, Jen Bourbon draws inspiration from textile artist and printmaker Annie Albers. With a background in the Bauhaus School of Art, German-born Albers had an incredible ability to blur the lines between traditional craft and fine art. When Albers was teaching at Black Mountain College, so-called typewriter studies formed part of her curriculum. The designs, a sequence of aligned slashes, colons, underscores, the alternation of uppercase and lowercase s's, 
imitated the gridded space and the interplay of warp and weft, and aided in creating what Albers called tactile textile illusions. As with Emily Dickinson, Vervin was intrigued by Albers' markings, and she set out to do her own experimentation with typewriters, texts, and textiles. Draft notation is the compilation of typed studies made on several typewriters over the course of the year. It includes four pale green books with a total of 57 type studies reproduced in letterpress, a unique typing on red board, facsimiles of nine studies made on different typewriters, a typed process note from Jen Bourbon, and a colophon, all contained in a sailcloth covered clamshell box. The title refers to the pre-weaving design diagrams a weaver creates or consults to plan her work on the loom. Some of the notations were created while listening to poetry recordings and interviews, hence the quotations that appear. Bourbon was also heavily influenced by early mending samplers, like the ones we have already seen, wherein complex woven patterns are replicated with a needle and thread to show off the darning skills of an embroiderer. Within Bourbon's draft notations, there is an incredible amount of intertextuality to sift through, even when there is no text present. Sometimes, the deeper meaning is found elsewhere. In the words of Annie Albers, wherever meaning has to be conveyed by means of form alone, where, for instance, no written language exists to impart descriptively such meaning, we find a vigor in this direct, formative communication often surpassing that of cultures that have other, additional methods of transmitting information. Anne Greenwood's Winter Count provides us with a phenomenal example of how other cultures communicate and transmit information across generations. Among several tribes on the Northern Plains, the passage of time was marked by noting a single memorable event, recorded pictographically, on a buffalo or deer hide. It was called the winter count because the year ended when winter was over and new life began in the grasses and trees of the plains. Winter was the opportune time to look back over the year and record its history. A tribe historian was responsible for the winter count and as the hides would deteriorate, the images would be transferred over to new hides. The tribe historian was also responsible for learning all of the stories before him as well as interpreting the drawings and history for anyone who asked about the record. The Big Missouri Winter Count began in 1796 and ended in 1926. It covered 131 years of events from one division of the Dakota Nation along the Big Missouri River. Anne Greenwood began her own Winter Count in January 2007, but instead of drawing images on buffalo hide, she stitched her winter count with embroidery and reclaimed linen. The images were pulled from ruminations in her life, titled with the year of origin and a short phrase to note the major event, place, state of mind, or primary activity of the year. The images were then transferred to letterpress with colors and size closely matching those of the embroidered cloth. The names of the stitches are listed in order from the border to the background to the central image. 1970, Pumpkin Patch, Tom and Anne, Alternating Stem Stitch, Variation on Couching, Double Running or Holbein Stitch. 1973, First Grade, Variation on Couching, Outline or Stem Stitch, Variation on Running Stitch, Satin Stitch, Double Running or Holbein Stitch. 1974, North Dakota Prairie, Geese, Crocus, Spring, Threaded Running Stitch, Fly Stitch, Outline or Stem Stitch, Satin Stitch. 1984, Puberty, Double Threaded Running Stitch, Double Running Stitch, Seed Stitch, Outline or Stem Stitch. 1994, Mauricio Rio Seco, French Knots, Couching, Cretan Stitch, Double Running or Holbein Stitch. 2003, Handwork, Double Running or Holbein Stitch, Chain Stitch. Russian chain, stem stitch. Greenwood took to needle and thread to tell the story of her life in Winter Count. In doing so, she found that the language of textiles would be useful to tell yet another story, that of poet Hazel Hall. 
Like Emily Dickinson, Hall lived out her life in the upper room of her family's house in Portland, Oregon, confined to a wheelchair. Despite the challenges she faced, Hall helped support her mother and two sisters by taking on the occupation of sewing and embroidering, things like bridal gowns, baby dresses, altar clothes, and lingerie. For Hall, the topic of needlework was prolific in her poems and was often used as a metaphor to describe her limited mobility, isolation, and loneliness. Greenwood's affinity for Hall's needlework poems is a natural fit, since her own work incorporates textiles, needlework, and print media to explore and extend historical and cultural understanding. For Tapestry of Hours, Greenwood collaborated with another artist, Shannon Ayuya, who also requires a wheelchair to navigate the world. Ayuya was born with a rare bone disease, osteogenesis imperfecta, and in the periods of recovery from surgery and pain, she learned to embroider and crochet. Together, Greenwood and Ayuya cut up Hall's poems, created fragments, reassembled words, and stitched up a whole new set of poems. The resulting project, from the media and materials used by the artists to their lived experience and shared goals of collaboration and connection, is reflected back to us through analogies of mending and growth in Hall's poetry. Here are old things, frayed edges, raveling threads, and here are scraps of new. Another artist book which looks to Hazel Hall for inspiration is Daya Fisher's Something Sorrow Has Made. This book revisits some of Hall's poetry while offering a new presentation of the text through the tactile intimacy of textile media. From the textured paper to the threaded pages, something sorrow has made reflects the vibrant imagination that colored the life of Hazel Hall within those four gray walls. In an introduction to the collection of needlework poems, John White wrote, as both seamstress and poet, she enjoyed the fortuitous coincidence of two activities that ingeniously referred to and informed one another, the interplay of stitch and song. In these needlework poems, Hall's life and her art effortlessly converge, resulting in breathtaking sorties beyond her window into the world of our shared experience. Through the ritual of sewing, Hall recovers the memories and vivid sensations of her childhood. Through her needlework and her poems, Hall was able to transform her loss into something of value, utility, and beauty. Having sewn and written all day, she would have by tomorrow something sorrow has made. Hall's memory grows ever more inclusive, finally involving all working and sorrowing women, sewing together in concert. Ellipses and dashes reminiscent of Dickinson's proliferate. A new and clearly modern severity and intensity surges through the poems, propelled by startling imagery and muscular diction. Hazel Hall's first published poem appeared in 1916, when she was 30 years old, with only eight more years to live. Refusing her confinement, Hall plotted in the poems that follow her escape into a world that was lush, vivid, and throbbing with life. Many of the artist books we have seen thus far have used the combination of text and textile to pay homage to the women before them, and this book is no different. In fact, it quite literally asks its reader to remember the ladies in a collage of floral prints, sequins, and lace. The title comes from a letter written by Abigail Adams, wife of former president John Adams. In the letter, dated March 31, 1776, the future First Lady urges her husband and other members of the Continental Congress not to forget about the nation's women when fighting for America's independence from Great Britain. She wrote, in part, I long to hear that you have declared an independency. And, by the way, in the new code of laws which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion 
and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. In her book, Sandy Washer James uses Abigail Adams' quote to honor and remember more than two dozen incredible American women, such as Harriet Tubman, Sacagawea, Georgia O'Keeffe, Ida B. Wells, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Willa Cather. Each page of the book contains postage stamps that have been color copied onto fabric and collages and stitched onto chintz backgrounds with lines of text printed on white ribbon. The book was bound by Washer James in Liberty Lawn Fabrics and in an edition of 10 copies. Although the language of textiles appears throughout the world and spans centuries of history, it is not necessarily a universal language. For instance, the deeper meanings of the kipu have yet to be deciphered. In archaeological terms, a kipu is defined as a set of knotted cords hanging from a primary cord or crossbar to record or transmit information. Every element in a kipu, from the number and position of knots to the direction of spin and the color, carries meaning. The oldest archaeological kipu was discovered in the Peruvian city Caral and dates back to 4600 BC. In cultural terms, the kipu embodies the Andean worldview of interconnectedness, a system of knowledge that reads not just a space, but everything in between. In a small highland community in Peru, kipus are still in use. Cecilia Vicuña's Chancani Kipu reinvents the concept of the Kipu and transforms it into a metaphor in space. It is both a book and a sculpture that condenses the clash of two cultures and worldviews, the Andean oral universe and the Western world of print. In Quechua, the word Chancani means to begin, while Kipu means to not. Here, the floating words take the place of the knots, while the unspun wool takes the place of the twisted threads. In the Andean mythopoetic universe, unspun wool represents that which has not yet happened, all potential, the uninformed. The thread, on the other hand, stands for the thread of life, and the knot, a thread turned on itself, is a metaphor for awareness, aware of itself. The reader of the kipu is the kipu kamayuk, which quite literally translates to the one that animates, gives life to the knot. For Rakunya, Chankani kipu is a prayer for the rebirth of a way of writing with breath, a way of perceiving the body and the cosmos as a whole engaged in a continuous reciprocal exchange. At this point, I must interject. The pictures simply do not do these books justice. And if we are to talk about the relationship between text and textile, we must also talk about texture. We must talk about the tactile experience one has when looking at these books and how that experience influences our understanding of the material, both literally and figuratively. So before I continue, I have to remind you that although we aren't meeting in class at this time, you can still come view these books and other items from the Rare Books collection in the Special Collections Reading Room, because there is truly nothing like holding the real thing. Denise Bookwater's Liney is definitely a book that you'll want to see and touch. It is all about the fabric and clothing that goes next to the skin. Silky solid polyester, felt, satin, knit, and ripstop nylon five fabrics which have been mounted on a page that folds out to reveal it as a lining. The pages are laser cut with images of each featured fabric as seen through the lens of a microscope, while poems describing each fabric are letterpress printed opposite the illustrations. I am a firm believer that books speak to us in more ways than one. Beyond the text on the page, the size, shape, and material qualities of each book influence our reading and transmit information that we may not be entirely conscious of. Now let's do a little thought experiment. Close your eyes and think of holding your favorite book. Imagine its weight in your hands, the texture of its cover, the smell of the paper, and the sound it makes when you turn the page. 
hold on to those thoughts for just a moment longer. Now open your eyes and look at the book in front of you. Notice its frayed edges and translucent silk organza wraps. Imagine turning its weightless pages and the unexpected silence that occurs when they touch. Silence is the key component in this artist book, the first in a series of works from Dea Fisher conveying her journey with grief. The book's form was inspired by the 1950s oscilloscope images that recorded sound waves made by music. Meanwhile, the text is taken from Khalil Gibran's poem, The Song of Ages. It reads, Now I have learned to listen, to silence, to hear its choir singing, the song of ages, chanting the hymns of space, and disclosing the secrets of eternity. Gibran and his family immigrated from Lebanon to the United States in 1895. They settled in Boston South End, where the second largest Syrian Lebanese American community was located at the time. Coincidentally, Gibran's mother, Camila, worked as a seamstress peddler, selling lace and linens that she carried door to door. According to linguist and translator Robert Brinkhurst, the idea of text is an ancient metaphor. Thought is a thread, and the raconteur is a spinner of yarns. But the true storyteller, the poet, is a weaver. The scribes made this old and audible abstraction into a new and visible fact. After long practice, their work took on such an even, flexible texture that they called the written page a textus, which means cloth. In Loom, the concept of the poet as weaver takes on a whole new meaning. Loom was published by Nawakam Press in collaboration with printmaker Richard Wagner and poet Alan Looney. The origins of this interwoven tale begin with Wagner, who developed a fascination with distressed fabrics and began exploring the structure of the loom and the process of weaving in the only way that he knew how, through art. After coming to the question, how many threads does it take to make a weaving, Wagner started a series of drawings exploring the threads of a loom. Those drawings then turned into woodcut engravings. Although the format didn't seem right, the engravings resonated with Wagner. He showed the finished pieces to Alan Looney and asked if he could consider writing something to go with the prints. The initial three engravings were based directly on drawings, evoking the warp and weft of fabrics so loose you can count the number of threads. Three turned into 16, each progressively more complex, more densely woven textile fragments, giving way to grids of almost solid color. Looney and Wagner both agree that the accompanying poems should not simply illustrate or describe the wood engravings. Looney explains, they became not things to write about or to interpret, but vehicles for all the thought and feeling possible in the dual engagement I had with them, both in the nervous, tenuous, fragile lines and the dense, solid, adamantine black of the slab in which the lines live. It was a chance to explore the beauty between connection and disconnection found in both woven work and the fabric of life. In the end, Looney settled on a format of seven lines of poetry per page, with seven words in each line. When printed, the shape takes on that of the wooden shuttles used by hand weavers to form the weft in woven fabric. One such poem reads, What is longer, nor the line. What is thinner, nor the skin. What is deeper, nor the dark. What is tighter, nor the weave. What is denser, nor the wood. What is sharper, nor the blade. What is brighter, nor the total sum. What is falser, nor the heart. Do you wear your heart on your sleeve? This phrase, we've all heard it before. It's a way to say that you show your emotions in an open and honest manner. But have you ever thought about why we wear emotions and why on a sleeve? Let's get to the heart of this matter, so to speak. The first recorded use of the expression can be found in William Shakespeare's play, Othello. 
In the tragedy, the dishonest and villainous Diago says, For when my outward action doth demonstrate, the native act and figure of my heart, in compliment extern tis not long after, but I will wear my heart upon my sleeve for daws to peck out. I am not what I am. Looking a little deeper, Shakespeare was likely inspired by medieval knights, jousters to be more specific. In the Middle Ages, sleeve not only referred to a part of a garment covering the arm, but to a piece of armor for covering and protecting the arm. When participating in a joust, knights would often dedicate their performance to a lady of the court and wear something of hers, such as a scarf or ribbon, around their sleeve of armor, which indicated to the tournament spectators which lady the knight favored. This chivalrous and affectionate gesture may be the true source of the saying, wear your heart on your sleeve. Diane Fine and Catherine Kuhn are two contemporary artists who wear their hearts on their sleeves, or dresses, shirts, and other pieces of cloth. Their book, Detours, was developed over several years and many sessions of list writing and editing. Together they compiled about 100 phrases beginning with words, if only. They read these back and forth to each other until they honed down the list. Then they recorded the chosen text by sewing them onto found remnants of clothing. These samplers were scanned and printed. Fine and Kuhn wrote lead-in phrases that were printed letterpress for each image. Some of the phrases include, If only my Russian weren't so rusty. If only I'd thought to put gas in the car before I crossed the border. If only I'd let them know my opinion from the get-go. If only I understood earlier what I couldn't possibly know. For Sue Carey Drummond, cloth often represented memories and scars. Where one would see a fraying seam or a rip in a shirt, Drummond saw marks on the skin. Looking to her own wardrobe, she learned to translate these marks in paper pulp and prints, imitating the subtle accumulation of life's wear and tear. Drummond tangled herself up in the vernacular of textiles, mending together conversations with her mother and other women to emphasize the relationship between figure and frock. In her book, A Darning Stitch, Drummond focuses on the sewing technique known as darning, a stitch that imitates the texture of a fabric that is to be mended. It is used for repairing worn areas in a garment in an attempt to make the repair as neat as possible and restore the piece of cloth to its original integrity. It is also known as an invisible mend. The stitch requires vigilance. You have to mend from the inside out. The metaphor of mending is found throughout the entire text, which articulates a deeply personal, though quasi-fictional, moment of reflection. The text collates sewing instructions between a narrative of strained but ultimately rescued relationship. The narrative is ruptured to mimic unraveling cloth. For this, Drummond uses a blowout papermaking technique in which she punctures sheets of freshly pulled paper with water. Between these sheets, she layered translucent sheets of overbeaten abaca paper, the gaps accentuated by the overlaid silk-screened images. In the artist statement, Drummond writes, We seek to give our pain value, importance, or significance. We return to it, wallow in it, hold on to it. The emotional pain we experience is the residue of the past moments or encounters, alluding to personal narratives that cannot be erased. In my work, I explore representations for this pain, creating a visual language with which to address the cyclical nature of damage and repair. I revel in the suggestive nature of degradation, drawn to tattered edges, worn surfaces, and ragged openings in need of mending. Through my studio investigations, I examine forms of damage and deterioration, mapping the accumulation of everyday losses, both small and large, and examine how they compile over time, leaving a mark upon us. More specifically, I draw from my intimate relationships and experiences as a way to explore these ideas while also commenting on larger themes of nostalgia, loss, and absence. I constantly consider surface. What sits above, within, or below? Questioning what is revealed or what is concealed. What is hidden, mended, or exposed? The physical layering of materials and processes communicates how these moments accrue over time further emphasizing acts of damage or repair. 
allowing the process to become a concept as well. I employ repetition to highlight futile attempts to mask the past. If you liked this virtual lecture, be sure to explore the Rare Books virtual lecture series with presentations that touch upon a wide variety of different subjects. Here you can find even more digital resources for reference and research. Here you can learn what a book is exactly and what makes a book rare. You can also gain insight to the vast networks of the book's history and explore how early manuscripts influenced the design of the book for years to come. Dive deeper into politics, science, and literature, and celebrate the Spanish language with an introduction to Jaconic's artist books. And just when you think you've had enough, learn how to transform your creative writing to make your very own artist book. Once you're done exploring the virtual lectures, head over to the digital exhibitions page. Our digital exhibitions are compiled from past exhibitions that were physically displayed in the Special Collections Exhibition Gallery on the fourth floor. We're currently working on updating our digital exhibitions, so be sure to check back for more. The curation of each exhibition is centered around a specific topic or theme. For example, our most recent digital exhibition focuses on radical political literature in the 20th century. Lastly, I invite you to subscribe to Open Book, the Marriott Library's official Rare Books blog. Open Book is a great way to explore the breadth and depth of the Rare Books collection. About once a week, we feature a book or books from the collection with a little bit of information. The choices might seem random, but there is a method to the madness. We promise. By exploring Open Book, you'll get to see the vast networks that connect languages, cultures, and periods of history. Plus, you'll be able to impress your friends, family, and even professors with tidbits of knowledge from each post. To subscribe to the blog, enter your email and hit subscribe. To search our archives, click on View All Rare Books Posts. If you have any questions about the books in this presentation or about any of the books in our collection, feel free to send us an email or check us out on our website, lib.utah.edu forward slash collections, forward slash rare books.